part three, specifically chapter 13, but we're dealing with packet switching and networking technologies. Uh, this chapter we're focusing on packet switching, packet technologies uh, that are used by guided and unguided media, or wired versus wireless. Like I said, specifically chapter 13 deals with our LANs, our local area networks, our packets, our frames, and our topologies. So before we get like super in depth, uh, packet versus frame, what's the difference? So when we start talking about our different layers within the OSI model, seven layers, and we focus on layers one, two, and three for our physical, so those are what deal with our physical devices. At layer one, we're dealing with hardwired medias, or bits. On layer two, our da data link layer, we're actually dealing with our frames. And then on layer three, our network layer, we're dealing with our packets. Uh, packets and frames are just ways of encapsulating data. So conceptually, if you think of a envelope and you stick something in the envelope, that's encapsulation. And then you stick that envelope into another envelope, that's just another layer of encapsulation. So in this example, we could have data put into a packet, the packet put into a frame. That's just one uh, letter envelope, the first envelope into the second envelope, and you got the concept. This chapter focuses on circuit switching, packet switching, local and wide area packet networks, our different types of IEEE 802.x standards, our topologies, uh, then we're going to start getting into some packet identification, multiplexing, demultiplexing, addressing, uh, frames and bits and bytes versus bits and whatnot. This is actually one chapter that should be multiple chapters. That's a lot of information, so this might be a little bit longer than normal. So we start off with chapter 13 very specifically because it examines packet switching technologies. So I know I just said packet switching, but we're going to talk about circuit switching and then packet switching. Because one, we can't understand one without the other, and we can't understand why we went from the older one to the newer one. So circuit switching refers to a communication mechanism that establishes a path between a sender and receiver. So our old phone systems, dedicated pathways between our sender and our receiver. Though this guaranteed isolation from the path used by other senders and receivers, it's just realistically we can no longer dedicate specific is uh, isolated paths for all of our senders and all of our receivers. It's just no longer realistic. Uh, you see this, or you've seen this predominantly within the cable company. When you picked up your telephone, you dialed the number, it should only be you and the other end on that line if it was working correctly. So instead of having a physical hard wire between one uh, sender and all possible receivers, they did what was called a virtual circuit. And that is, you connect to a centralized office location, and that centralized office location had some type of switchboard to another centralized office to help kind of virtually give you that dedicated link, even though there was not a specific hardwired link. Here is an example, conceptually, of our circuit switching. More specifically, uh, our circuit switching was uh, broken down into a few different areas, which is point to point. That means, again, uh, isolated from one another. 
separated steps for circuit creation and use and termination. So basically we're distinguishing our circuits that are switched, i.e. only established when they're needed from circuits that are permanent. And the performance uh, equivalent to the isolated physical paths, uh, as well as the cost associated with individual isolated paths. So, let's move on to packet switching. So, packet switching actually allows us to share a media. So, instead of having to do multiple paths, we can actually just share one wire. And then how we communicate on that shared wire is what's important. On our shared wire, we can actually chunk up our conversations so that we can put multiple communications or multiple conversations on one wire. Uh, it's basically instead of trying to have one large package, we can actually ship several smaller packages a lot easier. Then it goes into well, what if one gets lost. With this type of packet switching uh, design, because it's broken up in manageable chunks, if one packet gets lost, we can just resend the small packet. We don't have to send to the entire thing. Now, for voice communication, it doesn't really work well, but for other forms of data communication, it works well, very well. A packet switch system requires the senders to divide the message or break the message up into blocks of data known as packets or packages. Uh, because again, a packet is also a layer 3 term used for that envelope. And that's why I call them packages, not packets, uh, because you can they're both referred to as packets, it's just confusing for a lot of people. The nice thing here is this is all done by our equipment. So then the next question then becomes, well, who controls the sending and receiving? What happens if one computer is sending more than the other? Uh, how do we actually chop up that one media? So there's one way. I'm looking specifically at the fifth bullet point. Performance varies due to statistical multiplexing uh, among packets. So basically, we can have a statistical analysis performed where they, we analyze all the PCs and what they're sending and then we allocate a PC with one more uh, one additional block extra than other ones because they send more. Our goal is to maximize the efficiency of what we're putting on that data link or on that wire. If let's assume we have three people and our three PCs all trying to communicate, we can actually do it in a round-robin way. First PC1, then PC2, then PC3, then back to PC1. But what happens if, at a given point, PC2 has nothing to send? So for that time that PC2 has that stick, that wire is not transmitting anything. That's no longer efficient. That's actually why we have our statistical multiplexing method. I apologize for that. I have, I have the hiccups right now. Ooh. So one of the chief advantages for packet switching is it actually lowers the cost of our media because we no longer have to have, we no longer have, to have a dedicated pathway for our medias. Granted, that we now have to share that centralized connection, what is the likelihood that any one person is going to overwhelm it? So, I mean, it's all about getting the most out of our equipment. 
It's kind of like last week when we talked about our broadband carriers. How we might have, if, assuming you have cable, you might have one connection coming into an area, to a community, and then from that centralized area, one cable going all the way to each of the homes in that area. All of the people that have cable connect back to that junction box, but then there's one cable from that junction box back to the cable company. It's the same concept here. So we've already talked about our lands, our mans, our wans. So now we're actually going to break, in, break them up into a little bit better definitions. Uh, normally we're talking about costs and we're talking about resource location. So a land, it's going to be the least expensive and it could span a small area. Now, a single room or small building, it's too subjective to say that small. It's just, we're going to share a local resource with one another. Man's a little bit more expensive, and they can span a little bit larger of an area. Wan, most expensive, and it can span a heck of a lot wider than man's, or land's. Basically, a WAN is a large collection of lands and mans put together. Okay. So each packet uh, is sent across uh, such of a network must contain some form of identification, some form of address. Without addressing, we really can't guarantee or with any level of certainty get information from one location to another. It's like when you mail a piece of uh, a letter off in the mail. If it doesn't have an address, it cannot get there. If it doesn't have a return address, it might not be able to get back to you if it's not deliverable. Or you want to know, have them know who sent it. So within the uh, early 80s, the IEEE organization uh, that's one of our big standards for anything electrical. They introduced Project 802. 802 dot whatever is actually typically our networking and communication standards protocol. So when we talk about our Ethernet, that's 802.3. If we talk about our wireless, that's 802.11. If we talk about our WiMAX, that's 802.16. Don't worry, I have a chart towards the end that breaks down our 80, uh, IEEE 802 dot whatever standards, just because there's a lot of them. And each standard has very specific ways on how we communicate. IEEE is the most, uh, mostly comprised of, again, engineers who focus specifically on the lower layer, lower layers, that's layers, one, two, and three, and they actually deal with our electrical. They're not the only one. Uh, we have the World, uh, World Wide Web Consortium, we have the Internet Engineer Task Force, we have IANA, we have several organizations that control our networking. Have to let some bureaucracy sometimes, so. So, when we talk about w World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, they are mainly focused with the Internet and Transport layer. When uh, we talk about IEEE, they are mainly focusing on the bottom layers. When we talk about uh, IETF, the Internet Task Force, they are mainly focused on the middle layers. This is just an example of where we're kind of locating uh, these different standard groups in as we talk about our textbook. So, let's talk about layer 2 some. So, I already said that that was associated with our data link layer. This is where our frames are at. But this is actually one of the only layers that give us two sublayers. And that is our LLC or logical link control 
and our Mac or Media Access Control layers. So our LLC, it actually deals with our multiplexing and our addressing. Our MAC address is access to shared media or media access control. Clever way to say MAC because the purpose of MAC is its name, media access control. Uh, but what does that mean though? So specifically the MAC layer uh, specifies how multiple computers share the underlying media, whether it be physical or or guided or unguided, uh, physical or non-physical, it's controlled by our Mac. So let's talk about the identification portion of our Layer 2 model. Uh, well, this with our Layer 2 model. Uh, we're going to talk about Mac addresses here in a bit, but we're going to talk about specifically our models and standards. Sorry. So here we talk about our category and subcategories. So like our 802 dot whatever. Our 802 is our main category. And then they might have subcategories and then sub subcategories. And here is the example of what I mean. 802.1. This used to be higher layer LAN protocols. 802.2, that's our link or logical link controller. 802.3, this is the one that most people are most familiar with, that's our wired Ethernet. 802.4 and 5, that's our token ring bus and hub, which both of those kind of don't exist anymore. 802.6, our MANs, don't really exist anymore. 802.7, our broadband LAN using coax, that doesn't really exist anymore. 802.9 and 10, those would be our LAN security and integrated services for our LAN, aren't really used anymore. 802.11, Wi-Fi, that's huge. 802.13, that's our CAT6, our Ethernet 6 cable, which actually gives us our 10 gigabit per second LAN connections. 802.14, that's our cable modem or modems. That's kind of subjective if it's to spanned or not because there are substandards for cable modem that still exist. 802.15, that's our wireless PANs, specifically Bluetooth. So here is a category, a subcategory, and a sub subcategory. 802.15, wireless PANs. 802.15.1, Bluetooth versus 802.15.4 Zigbee. Uh, what the hell is Zigbee? I have no idea. Bluetooth is one that I'm familiar with, but Zigbee, no. 802.16, our WiMAX. This is our broadband wireless accessory. That's our high level, high uh, frequency broadband. 802.17, that's our resilient packet ring. I'll let you read the rest because I covered the major ones that most people are associating with. I take that back. 802.20, that would be our emerging mobile brand, uh, broadband wireless access. That's a huge one that's growing in popularity. And as we need more, we just keep adding more sub uh, subcategories. Let's go back to our point-to-point -point multi access networks. What exactly does that mean? Point-to-point -point is one point to another point, and there is nothing in between. But if you have the internet, that is not point-to-point. -point. That is a point-to-multi-point-to-point. -point -point. Because as it goes to the internet, there is no direct dedicated path. This is an open pathway, so it can take multiple different paths. So sometimes we use the term multi-access. Multi-access is just 
our devices have the ability to access multiple devices. That's it. Now let's talk about our topologies. How do we conceptually lay these out? How do we organize them? How do we, uh, how are they generally shaped? So we cover, there's not just four, there's several, but we cover just our basic four here. That's our bus topology, our ring topology, our mesh, and our star. So a bus is like a straight line. A ring is a ring. A star, everything connects to a centralized device. Lastly, which I know is the third one, not the last one, but I like to do mesh last. Mesh actually is all devices connected to all other devices. Then there might be a subcategory of mesh called a partial mesh. That's where some devices are connected to all other devices, but not necessarily all devices have to be. Here they are again. A bus is again one straight line. A ring is a big circle. A star is centrally connected. And the mesh, everything connected to everything else. Our bus topology usually, usually consists of this one cable. And the end of that one cable is terminated. Basically, it goes in order. Left to right or right to left doesn't matter. But it goes down the wire. When it gets to the end of the wire, there's a terminated block there that sends the cable or the signal back the other way. Both ends have terminated blocks, and they just go back and forth. But because it's a bus, the computer that attached to the bus must coordinate when they're going to talk and who's, what rules are associated with talking, and things like that. The ring topology is a big closed loop that goes in order. Uh, they do some form of election. One person has a talking stick, and if you have the talking stick, you get to talk. And then it goes around the loop. But if there's ever a break in the loop, all communication then fails. So you could actually put two loops in there, or two rings in there, have a dual ring. That's one topology we didn't talk about, which is just a ring with two rings in it. Our mesh. Uh, this is one of the issues with our mesh. is All devices are connected to all other devices. So let's say you have 30 computers. Each computer has 30 connections. One connection per other computer. That'd be way too complex, way too expensive, way too many connections and a huge mess. Next is our star. That is, everything is connected to a centralized point or hub. This is where our switch comes in, because we don't call it a hub anymore. Uh, a hub is a dumb switch. A switch is a smart hub. But basically it's a smart device in the center that is reliable so that we communicate through that. So why do we care for multiple topologies? There is no one shoe fits all. Thus, we have to have different topologies for different situations. Uh, realistically, nowadays, star or mesh or some form of star hybrid mesh are the ones that have taken over. So now let's get back to our packet identification, our demultiplexing, and our media access control addressing. So our MAC address. This is a physical address that's burnt in to our network interface cards. So where you plug in a, uh, the cable for your network connection to your computer, that's a NIC. Where you plug in your USB wireless controller, that's a wireless NIC. Whether it be built in or external, it doesn't matter. If you connect to a network, 
you have a network interface card. That card has an address associated with it. If we're talking about a data network, normally we're talking about a MAC address and a IP address. You're talking about cell phones, they have a unique identifier that identifies them to the cell phone companies. Every device connecting to a network has some form of identification address. That way it can be sent and receive information on that network. So let's talk a little bit more in depth about our MAC address. Our media access control address consists of 48 bits. And that, again, is burnt into a network interface card. So how we uniquely identify this is the first three bytes, or 24 bits, are known as the organizational unique identifier. The last 24 bits, or 3 bytes, is the network interface controller. So uh, essentially, let's say you're 3COM. 3COM, the first 24 bits that all of their products will produce are going to be the same organizational ID, or OUI. And only the last 24 bits will change. That way, if you know the OUI, the Organizational Unique ID, you know who manufactured it. Now, if you have a problem with it, you can return it back to that manufacturer. So now, let's talk about the bottom of the screen. Unicast versus multicast, or global versus local. So, in the first group of 8 bits, the 7th and 8th bit the seventh bit specifically, is it going to be local or is it going to be a global address? Essentially, is it going to be part of our LAN or part of our WAN? If it's part of our WAN, it's global. If it's part of our LAN, it's going to be part of our local. Our eighth bit, is it unique? Is it going to one device? Is it going to multiple devices? Or could it be going to more than that? So let's talk about unicast. Unicast is a package or a packet going from one device to one other specific device. A broadcast is one device to all other devices. A multicast is one device to a select few of other devices. So I want to generalize this just because it's it's a little bit easier to generalize this one. So are you mailing a letter from one person to another person? Unicast, one. If you're mailing a letter blanketing an area, it'd be a broadcast. You're mailing it to everyone. Now let's say you want to mail the letter just to guys, or just to girls in black shoes, or whatever is your criteria. That would be multicast. You don't mail it to everyone, but you don't mail it to just one. You mail it to a specific group of people. So why is it that the first eight bits we were looking at just unicast and multicast? That's because broadcast is a specialized, if it's a broadcast, it's all ones. That means everything is all one, and our devices know that that means send it to everyone else. So now let's talk about our efficiency of our unicast, multicast, and broadcast. So broadcast and multicast are useful within a local connection, but not really that useful in a larger network. If we're dealing with a MAN or a WAN, it's just not as efficient. Because what happens in a LAN is all computers monitor the shared connection. All computers will 
if it's a broadcast, we'll extract the same packet and we'll examine it. If it's for them, they respond. If it's not, they drop it. But the fact that it was processed uses resources. Uh, the fact that it was looked at and then ignored uses resources. Thus, it's not very efficient to use on a larger network. So here is the basic algorithm. Is a packet derived over a LAN, extract the destination address from the packet, does it match my address? If it does, do this. If not, is it a broadcast? If not, is it a bro multicast? If not, then ignore the packet. It will go through this process for every packet. So, let's talk about more of our frames and framing, which this is chapter 9. We, we didn't do a lecture on, but within our textbook, that's the one dealing with our framing. And our framing typically is just, how do we know within our bits, large groups of ones and zeros, what's our beginning, what's our end? That's all framing is. Normally, framing consists of a header, and a trailer, and some form of data, sometimes called a payload. That way we know where it begins, our header, we know that there is a payload or data, and then there is some form of trailer. That way we know exactly where it begins and where it ends. This is our frame. So. What size for, uh, si what's the size of this in bits or bytes? So, here is our measurement for our frame. Normally our header is 6 bytes. We also have a start of the header character that's just more of a, like a hand waving going, this is the beginning. Then we have an EOT, an end of transmission character. That's a hand waving goodbye. These are specialized, agreed upon signals that denote the beginning and the end of a message. In ASCII, the beginning handshake is a hexadecimal number of 211. And the EOT is a hexadecimal number of 204. That is just the agreed upon, if, it, if it's 204 in hexadecimal, that's a end trailer. If it's 201, it's our start. If that's, that is just our agreed upon, standardized agreement. So what happens if our data has more or less, more or values that might be 102 or 104. So the answer lies in a technique known as byte stuffing. This basically allows the transmission of the data without any form of confusion. Because if we're looking specifically at this 201 and we're also sending 201, it might get confused with why there are two start headers or why there are two end headers. So there has to be a way to organize our frames. Notice, we just talked about bit framing. If our frame is agreed upon 150 bits, and our start frame and our end frame might be 10 bits, we know that something is off. We should go with both. The 150 bits that we agreed upon our frame size would be, plus looking at Roundabout, the beginning should be our 201, and our end portion should be 204. So essentially, it, the beginning one, so between 0 and 5 bits, we're looking for 201. At the 1490-ish uh, bits, we start looking for our 204. That way, anything between the other numbers, we don't get confused with. This basically allows us to 
do our friend uh, delimiters basically so that we don't get confused and end the frame too soon. So basically our SOH, our start and our end, are used to denote the beginning and end of a frame. We look for very specific portions within our payload. And that actually gives us very specific sequences so that we can make sure that we are sending and receiving the correct data. That way if we double check and we accidentally did send an additional 201, the sequences don't line up, so the equipment just ignores it and processes it regularly, versus receives it and goes, oh, this is the start of a whole new frame. That is it for today. Uh, the bit and the byte stuffing is actually not an area that we deal with heavily. Uh, normally our equipment is smart enough, so we don't have to deal with that, but it's a good idea to at least understand conceptually what it's talking about. If you uh, have any questions, please let me know. If there's anything else that I can do, again, please let me know, and I hope that you have a great day. Chapter 15. This is going to be dealing with our wired LAN technologies. That's going to include our 802.3 standard, which is known as Ethernet. A uh, big part of this chapter is the wired guided physical transmissions. Uh, chapter, uh, week 3, we actually cover, I think, 6 chapters altogether. And all of this is dealing with pretty detailed material. So I'm going to be doing videos for each chapter just so that we're, we know. So we're going to be doing things like... Uh, how the Ethernet uh, is made, uh, created, how is it made up, the types of fields in its header, the different versions, the evolution, uh, some of the earlier types of Ethernet, where we're at now, our physical and logical topologies, wiring office buildings, variations, pairing of cabling, and that's it. So just uh, 13 sections. A uh, big part of this chapter is, again, we're, we're discussing or we're focusing on our LANs. So that's our local area network. And, again, focusing on the wired functionality for this chapter. So, one of the big things here is, as we progress within our Ethernet standard, is keeping everything backwards compatible. And that's actually really interesting because not a lot of technologies stay black backwards compatible meaning as we grow and develop new technology eventually we have to drop older technologies ethernet really wasn't like that and the nice thing with ethernet is it's really evolved very heavily in the last several years and that's not just with the devices or the cabling uh, the actual ethernet itself has changed because it used to be a very fixed set format and now it, there's a lot more flexibility with that. So what does the frame format mean? So basically the frame is at layer 2 we're dealing with the frames at layer 3 we're dealing with packets but it's how is that data organized before it's sent on the wire. The, that's what our header portion is. A uh, big part of that is also dealing with how we do the formatting. If you think of mailing a letter via a, an actual postal service, like your mailman, how do we lay out that letter? We have our source destination, top left hand corner, stamp top right hand corner. We have the actual destination, the center, but how do we do that? Uh, the sender, how do we do the destination, name, address, city, state, zip, country code? That's all a very specific structure or format. Our frame is the same way. It has a very specific structure. 
And that structure in a basic format is a header, which is six bytes for the destination, six bytes for our source. So what does that actually equal? That should be 48 bits. And then we have two uh, bytes of t uh, for our header. That header detail should also be two bytes. Should actually be 16 bits. So all of this together should allow for the first set of bits and the rest of it as a payload. So the payload actually is just an envelope from layer 3. So this is actually going to have its own header for layer 3, its own payload for uh, layer 3, and then it's just an envelope inside of an envelope inside of an envelope. Because with the OSI model, we're dealing with seven layers, and each layer packages the layer above it in an envelope. So how do we deal with our multiplexing for our Ethernet type? We've already kind of discussed multiplexing a little bit, and that is, again, being able to package a signal in such a way where we're able to, to share a shared media or share a common line. That way both people trying to send data are able to send it over that shared media. Here with our Ethernet, at least dealing with our layer 2 addresses, we're dealing with our MAC addresses, our media access control a uh, addresses. I know here it says we send P uh, IP datagrams and ARP messages over Ethernet, but an IP datagram is a layer 3 packet because IPs are done at layer 3. At layer 2 we're dealing with MAC addresses. Uh, ARP address resolution protocol that is actually just a lookup for our MAC addresses. Our MAC addresses are done in hexa uh, hexadecimal. So how do we actually do our demultiplexing? Here we have actually the ARP module and the IP module. Basically this allows us to start separating our frames so that they can go to the uh, above layers. So what is this 802.3 standard? 802.3 is the IEEE version of Ethernet. While it was originally developed in 83, it is not the only 802 standard. If you are dealing with wireless, like other chapters, that's 802.11. That's our wireless standards. But 80, going back to 802.3, we actually created our layered approach and dealing mainly focusing with our layer 2, we actually broke that data link layer up into two sublayers. Our logical link controller LLC and we also broke it down into our media access control. So how we do that is we add additional space for our header. 48 bits or 6 bytes. 48 bits, 16 bits, 24, 24, 16, and that makes up our 64. While that doesn't completely make up our 64, that makes a, up a portion of it. Because here are 6 bytes, 6 bytes, 2 bytes, so that should be 14. Here's an additional 3, 3, and 2. So that's 22 bytes. That means we still have an additional 24 bytes to, uh, for our header information to go. Because here our bytes of payload is 46 forward. So again, the overall frame, the sizing of it, normally is a MTU, because that's how we measure them, of 1500 bytes. Normally the first 8 bytes of the payload is will contain a snap header, 
That's just again a specialized header. But if you ever ask what's the normal size of a frame? 1500 bytes. Uh, actually, you end up, uh, when you start taking certification of the exams, you actually start getting asked questions about Ethernet fr uh, frame makeup in more than just networking. I actually did a VMware course and I was asked numerous questions on the size of Ethernet frames. So how does our LAN connect to our network? We focus mainly on that structure and that format for our data link layer, but what operates at that layer? And normally that's our NIC. Our NIC handles our address resolution, our errors, our frame recognition, sending and receiving of the, those frames and other data. But what is that NIC made out of? That NIC normally is a circuit board and a plug on one side. But that is our network interface connection card, or our network interface card. But its main role is a connection between our PC's bus and processor and resources to other nodes, other computers, other items for sharing, analyzing, collecting, all of the above. While Ethernet has gone through major changes uh, and gone through several formatting, uh, they're still growing strong. So now we're going to get into the different types of earlier Ethernet. And that's going to be our thick and thin wired Ethernet. Normally thin net and thick net. And normally this is going to be 10 base 5. Uh, when we actually start getting into our twisted pair, that's going to be a base 10. But essentially what we had to do is we had to have a way to uh, trans uh, to receive and actually transceive information from the computer to a connected cable so that other PCs could actually get it. A physical cable known as a AUI which actually allows for the, tran the transceiver to a NIC. Basically, it was a converter. It allows you to actually take from a NIC card and be able to communicate on that thick net wiring. If you think thick net, you think really thick coax. And so how that worked is we had a thick cable and we would tap into that cable using our transceiver and that tap would allow our, er, our computer to communicate on that single cable. That cable would have terminators on both sides and they would go back and forth. So that's thick, nut, uh, thick net in a nutshell. Then we had our thin net. So instead of having to all share common media, here we go from one PC to another, to another, to another. One of the problems with this though is they're shared. So that meant if one of the PCs went down, you could actually lose the connection further down. And again, this was uh, ran on smaller coax. Uh, Thinnet, its primary advantage was really easy, really cheap. Uh, thin net didn't have to have external transceivers like thick net. Uh, you could do it on a convenient path, but again, if one PC came unplugged, it cascaded down. So how do we, what do we go from there? From thick net to thin net, then where? The third major evolution of Ethernet was actually replacing the coax with twisted pair Ethernet. And that's what we have now. We have our Category 5, Category 5E, Category 6, twisted pair. And that is we have four pairs that are twisted that allow us to communicate over it. And what that did was it allowed us to connect centrally to a device, a hub or a switch. And that would allow us to connect and communicate locally. If we wanted to communicate with 
to another network, for example, would have to connect our hub or switch to a router. Because the hub and switch, they're layer 2 devices. They run off of MAC addresses. They work off of layer 2 addressing. A layer 3 device is the only type of device that can go from one network to a different network. That's important to realize. I know that's not really important for this class, but for future classes, that's super important. So what is a hub or switch? A hub emulates a physical cable and it allows you to send or receive data simultaneously. So how do we allow communication on those hubs and switches? So what it does is, it does this thing called CSMACD. Carrier Sensing Media Access Collision Detection. So what that did was, if all the PCs are talking at once, they're going to start canceling each other out. So the CSMA CD actually was a mechanism that was created so that PCs could not talk all at once. What this allowed the PCs to do was stop, listen, communicate. If they started sensing that they're communicating over someone else, they would stop for a random time and again send later. So that way if two people are talking at once this would go, okay, both wait a random amount of time and then try again. And then that's how our CSMA CD worked. It was an ingenious way. That way you, didn't nev you never had multiple devices talking on the sh same line at once. So you don't have to worry about collisions. Again, a collision is where just two things talking at once cancel each other out. Twisted pair uh, doesn't have to follow a strict type of topology, but if you had to kind of explain what twisted pair topology would be, it'd be a star. That is, everything connects to a centralized device and they communicate through that centralized device. So how do we understand the topology though? What's a logic topology and what's a physical topology? On exams, they'll ask things like this, so this is an important note. Uh, logically, that's going to be twisted pair is a connection between one device and another. It's more of a bus topology because again they d they share one part on each side so the PC to the switch the next PC to the switch the next PC to the switch those are all buses between the PC and the switch R even though physically while those are all buses collectively they all make a, a giant star but where does this come into play though I mean, where is this useful and that's where we start wiring a building. That's where this comes into play. So if we're going to be wiring a building, we have to make a few assumptions. What type are we doing? How many numbers are wiring? What's the distance? What's the cost? Is there centralization? Is there no centralization? Is it going to be future-proof, meaning we're going to have to plan for several years? So there are a lot of different ways to do this. So here's an example of our thick net and thin net. But again, both of these are old, out of date technologies. They're not really used. So realistically, what we'd end up be doing would be some type of centralized device, a hub or a switch, and all PCs connect to that. Granted, that does give you a single point of failure, that one switch, but that's why you make sure that one switch is a higher quality switch. Again, we've already talked about the importance of the evolution of Ethernet, how the development of it actually made uh, more sense. It stayed backwards compatible. It stayed relevant. It stayed moving in a forward path. Important things to remember is with our thick net, that's 10 base 2. With everything above our thin and thick net, that's 10 base T. That could be 100 base T, or that could be 1000 base T. 
The base T really just stands for our twisted pair. And they could be auto sensing, meaning they can determine the speed of the cable. So how we look at that is our designations, 10 base T, 100 base T, 1000 base T, or twisted pair, fast ethernet, or gigabit, or 10 megabits per second, 100 megabits per second, or 1000 gigabits per se or 1000 megabits per second, which is also equal to 1 gigabit per second. All of that matters. And then what happens if we're using specific types of cable? Will that matter? If we're using 10 base T, we just need regular category 5. If we're using 100 base T, cat 5e. If we're using 1000 base T or gigabit, you need either 5e or 6. I know this uh, talk about it, but what happens if we're doing 10,000 base T? Or that would be 10 gig. That'd be using category 6 or category 6e Ethernet. So again, these standards are always changing, they're always growing, always adapting. That's important to keep in mind. So what are our connectors? That's the last important one. With our Ethernet, they're a little bit thicker than a phone cable. A phone cable is an RJ11. It has two or three pairs of wires. Normally one pair or two pair, sometimes three pair, but the most common is one pair. An RJ45 are required to have four pair. There are two major types, straight through and crossover. And so the main differences between the straight through and crossover is the types of devices that you connect when hooking them up. For example, if you want to hook up two switches and you want them to communicate, you cannot use a straight through because what ends up happening is the four pairs of wires in a straight through they don't allow for communication on certain pairs. Hence why you have to use a crossover for like devices. Because the devices that are, that are alike are expecting to communicate and listen on different pairs. So again, like devices are cross cables. Anything else will be a straight through. So what are some crossover cables? PC to PC, switch to switch, router to router, those are all crossover cables. A PC to router directly sometimes has to be a crossover. A PC to a switch, a switch to a router, all of those are straight through. So normally this is where someone brings up, what about this auto MDXI? That auto senses and auto does this for us. So, you're noticing, maybe you not specifically, but if you've been doing this long enough, you'll start noticing that crossovers aren't really sold all that often. That's because most modern devices have an auto sensing. Though it's not an official standard, it's just one of those, it's out there. So you may or may not have it. So that's going to be our auto MDXI and that will allow you to use a straight through or a crossover and it does the connections automatically. Last thing is, how do we wire up our RJ45 head? There are two standards, 56A, 568B. Again, the first one is 568 Alpha versus 568 Bravo. There are two different standards. And what we do for a straight through, both standards, so it's an A on A on both sides or a B on B on both sides, a crossover is an A on one side and a B on the other. All that really means though is how are the wires used? Because you'll notice X for transmission, R for receiving. Really, you just need 1, 2, 3, and 6 to do a basic transmission and receive. Though if you want higher speeds, you need to have all of them. 
And that's it for that chapter. Hope you have a great day. Bye. Okay, so I wanted to discuss some follow-up items. One of the first things is our APA formatting and citation. That goes for both our IPs and our discussions. Remember that we have to do all of our work according to APA manual. So if you're not sure how to do that, go online. Uh, you can type in APA formatting. Uh, if you don't want to look it up online, you can go to any of the tutorial services. We have a writing, we have a library service. They can give you additional resources on how to do APA formatting. That's important. That's not going away. Uh, in discussions, same thing. We have to be doing our citations in our discussions because one of the big things is for our citations, we're building off of other people's works. So it's a way for us to verify what we're claiming is supported by the literature. So when I say something at the sky is blue, you can take my word for it, or if I provide a citation, you can take an expert's word for it, and then I built off of that. So it just kind of increases your credibility. We should be at least citing in every uh, post or as much as possible. Because again, we're trying to link what we've done back to the literature. Same thing in our IPs. Every paragraph should be uh, tied to a source. Every paragraph is an idea. And every idea we need to have support within the literature. And I know at this level it's not that big of an issue but you want to get in the habit of doing that so when you start doing higher level work it's second nature also length we don't need posts that are great job I mean don't get me wrong it does add to it but when I start grading for posts I'm not doing uh, full credit for those that have three posts and two of them are great jobs I don't count the great jobs as a post. For our discussion board, I'm looking for three solid responses with citations. Uh, for our papers, I'm looking for three pages of content with citations. So what I mean by content is that's three papers on topic. That's not a cover page, that's not your reference page, that's three content pages. Uh, two if you're really good, but I'm really looking for three. If you're doing uh, diagrams, diagrams totally are okay, as long as you're doing them within APA formatting. Lastly, grading. Again, I grade off of heavily off of attempt, like if you're putting an effort into it. Like if you did two pages and you did a few citations, and I could see that you were making an effort, I'll, I'll meet you. But if you post once, or you did a page and a half with one citation, you know, that really isn't you making an effort. Uh, if you get stuck, don't get me wrong, some people, a page is a lot. If you get stuck, you have plenty of resources to bolster up your paper. You can contact me, I'll help you. If you don't want to contact me, we have a writing uh, center, we have a tutorial, uh, tutorial center, we have plenty of help for you to get. If you need tutoring, there's a lot of tutoring out there, and uh, again, provided from the school. All you have to do is say something. For our tutorial lab, we have tutor uh, tutorial services for SQL, we have tutorial services for database, we have tutorial services for math, English, writing research, library services, I mean we have a great amount of tutorial services and if we don't offer tutoring in a specific area you can ask for it specifically and they will find tutors for you so you cannot use, you cannot get tutoring because you can if you ask for help the school will get it if you cannot get it from the school there's other help 
I will sit down with you. I will do as much as as much as I can with you if you need one on one. If you need tutoring and you don't get tutoring, that's not a failure on my part. That's not a failure on the school's part. That's only a failure on your part because there's plenty of opportunities there. You have my number, you have my email, you have two emails from me, you have my cell phone number, you have plenty of ways to get a hold of me if you need help. And again, if you don't capitalize on help and you need help, that's on you. That's on you. Okay, there's plenty of help out there. All you have to do is say something. Thank you.